So, hello and welcome to our talk on wrapping entire Kubernetes clusters into a confidential computing envelope with Constellation. Uh, just, just a quick question. Um, please raise your hands. Have you ever heard of confidential computing before? Okay, just, just a few. And are you already using confidential computing or are you planning on using this? Okay. Well, this is great because we will start with an introduction on what confidential computing actually is. We will explain how it can work by giving a concrete example that is AMD SEV. And then we will explain how Constellation works, which is our Kubernetes distribution that uses different confidential computing technologies to provide you with a full Kubernetes cluster that runs on confidential computing hardware. So with that, I will hand it over to Paul. Um, talking about cloud, when we are running our application in the cloud, um, what we essentially are doing is running our code on someone else's computer. And the cloud provider is in full control of the hardware. And often the hardware is also shared with other tenants. And here, for example, we have a virtual machine from our cloud provider. And the cloud provider manages different tenants, virtual machines with uh, something like a hypervisor. So what threats are we facing in the cloud? We have good protection during transit. We can use TLS or a virtual private network. We have also good protection at rest. We can use full disk encryption to protect our dat data there. But for processing, we need to decrypt our data. And at that point, all our data is stored in plain text in the main memory. So basically anyone with access to the main memory can read our secrets, our data. And for example, uh, or especially um, everyone with physical access to the machine could remove the memory and read out our secrets or mount a malicious device that uh, reads the secrets from the memory. Further, the hypervisor is in full control over the main memory. So everyone that is able to gain um, access over the hypervisor can read the full memory content. For example, there could be an insider attack by a cloud admin, um, or the cloud provider itself, or some services of a cloud provider could be compromised. And also we have attacks through other tenants, so-called cross-tenant attacks. And yeah, so even a tenant on the same machine could use some side channel attacks to extract data from the memory <coughs> that belongs to our virtual machine. So to sum up, we need to protect to, uh, we need also to protect our data in use. And for this talk, we're assuming an attacker model with an attacker that has somewhat cloud provider privileges. So what are we going to do about this? Confidential computing that rescue. Confidential computing uses hardware-based trusted execution environments to protect data confidentiality and data in integrity in use. And confidential computing also protects the code integrity in use. So we have strong isolation between different execution contexts. And often this is based on memory encryption. And we will now take a deeper look into one example for confidential computing hardware. Um, and see how this protection works. So the example we are uh, taking a look at is AMD Secure Encrypted Virtualization, which is essentially a feature of the CPU. And especially we are talking about the third generation called Secure Nested Paging. 
There are also other solutions by other vendors like Intel TDX, but yeah, we're taking a look at this example now. So this is a virtuali virtualization technology. So what we can do with it is we can create a confidential virtual machine, short CVM, um, in by uh, using a normal te virtualization technology, the hypervisor has full access to all the virtual machine's memory pages and contents. The hypervisor is in full control. But with, with confidential memory, uh, with confidential virtual machines, um, the virtual machine is protected against the hypervisor and also against other machines on the same host. So basically, we only have to trust our confidential virtual machine and the CPU, and these together form the trusted computing base. And we can do this by using the provided transparent memory encryption uh, of AMD SEV. So how does the memory encryption work? We have on the chip, as part of the CPU, a secret processor, which is a microcontroller. And this secret processor is also trusted. Like I said, the CPU is trusted. And within the processor, each confidential virtual machine has a separate key. These keys are inaccessible by software. And all memory pages of CVMs are encrypted in memory. So when the CPU loads a page from uh, the main memory, the page is decrypted with the CVM's uh, key. And when the page is stored again, the page is encrypted. And the secret processor um, tracks the page ownership of the memory pages and decides which keys to use. So with this mechanism, we uh, essentially pr protect our memory from the hypervisor and from other tenants virtual machines. So, are we done yet? <laughs> um, this is a good protection mecha mechanism, but how can we know that the encryption is actually used? We are talking about a remote system, right? So, and also, how can we know that actually the code is running that we are expecting uh, it to be running? So, and we also might want to know if the firmware that is providing this memory encryption is actually up to date and yeah i guess we need to verify it and we can do that with remote attestation so there's a quite new rfc from the beginning of this year that defines roles artifacts and procedures um, for remote attestation called remote attestation procedures and this is on a quite abstract level so um, what we want to do in remote attestation is we want to evaluate the trustworthiness of an entity. And especially here, the relying party um, wants to evaluate the trustworthiness of an attester. And the attester generates some form of evidence to prove its trustworthiness. And the evidence is generated through some form of measurements from what's actually there. And um, the verifier is the entity that evaluates the evidence. And for this, the verifier uses some form of reference values um, that are just like a list of values that is compared with values from the evidence. And some form of endorsement that is used to verify the authenticity of the evidence. And the endorsement vouches for the capabilities of the attester. So we will take a look, uh, a closer look now at the evidence generation. Or well, first, uh, yeah, the trust. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so um, for uh, uh, generating the evidence, we have to do some measurements. And the first measurement that we are generating is a launch measurement. And this is um, a measurement that we are generating at the VM start by the hypervisor. So during the start of the virtual machine, the secret processor 
measures all the memory pages that we are uh, loading for our virtual machine. Um, and we are using an iterative hash function, so we hash the previous uh, value with the page content and its metadata. And in the end, we have the launch digest or launch measurement, which is just a hash over the whole content of our virtual machine, essentially. And this is done by the secret processor. And each page is encrypted after we measured it. So this is like a hash over the content of our virtual machine. And as a second measurement, we have a platform measurement. And this is, a uh, is essentially the, the firmware state of the CPU and secret processor. So these are secure version numbers, so just an unsigned integer. And we have secret version numbers for the secret processor's operating system and bootloader, as well as for the processor firmware and the processor microcode. And with these measurements, we uh, can request an, att uh, an attestation by the verifier during the virtual machine runtime. And the confidential virtual machine will pass the request to the secret processor. And the secret processor will collect this evidence, or already collected the evidence, and will hand back an attestation report. And we will now take a look at this attestation report. So the attestation report is essentially the evidence for AMD SEV. And it has, it's like a, a struct that has many fields, but we are only taking a look at the ones relevant for the remote attestation part. So first, we have the reported uh, trusted computing base which is essentially our platform measurement from before. These are the secret version numbers of our firmware components of the processor and secret processor. Um, next, we have the launch measurement, which is the launch measurement from before. They hash about all our uh, confidential virtual machines memory pages. And this tells us what code we are actually running in the CVM. Next, we have a field for report data. And this is a really useful field, as we can include any arbitrary data from the attestation request. So this data is chosen by the verifier. And uh, it binds the, the data from the request to the attestation report. For example, we can use it for freshness by including a nonce. So, and in the end, the whole attestation report is signed by a versioned chip endorsement key. And we will take a look now at what a version chip endorsement key is. <laughs> so, this is a bit where the magic happens. The, each secret processor has a chip unique secret, which is the hardware root of trust. And this is a secret that is burned into fuses during the manufacturing time of the CPU. So it's not accessible or changeable by any software. And with this chip unique secret and our current secure version numbers, we can derive a public-private key pair using a key derivation function. And this um, key we are deriving is the version chip endorsement key, and it signs the attestation report. So it is the version key because we are including our secure version numbers, and it is, it's chip specific um, because it's derived from our chip unique secret. So in the attestation report, we also have a field um, chip ID, which uh, essentially identifies our CPU and connects the chip unique secret and the version chip endorsement key with our report. So next, 
um, we are sending the report to the verifier. And now the verifier wants to um, validate the report. And how can the verifier do this? The verifier can request an endorsement, which is the version chip endorsement key public key um, from the hardware vendor, in this case AMD. And we can get a certificate chain with uh, MD root CA that signs this version chip endorsement key. And to re request this key, we have to send um, the chip ID and the TCB uh, from before, because the yeah, it's uh, the key is specific to the chip and to the versions of our current firmware. And with this public key we can verify the attestation report. And if this uh, verification succeeds, we can be sure that the CPU was actually manufactured by AMD. And AMD also vouches for the CPU to have memory encryption and um, yeah, these attestation uh, capacities that we are actually using. So at this point, we essentially um, excluded the hypervisor from our trusted computing base. We don't have to trust the hypervisor or the cloud provider um, because we can attest based on the hardware that the hardware is secured with memory encryption and that exactly the code that we are expecting is actually running. All right, so now we will st take a, a step back and just think about what we actually want to achieve. So, so what we want to achieve in the end is to have a Kubernetes cluster where each node of the cluster is a confidential virtual machine. And we want to, to, to go from a single confidential virtual machine to a whole cluster of virtual machines that somehow, but, but somehow we want to be able to still have a way to establish trust as, as the administrator of the cluster. And ju just a quick reminder, this, this works, there, there's different technologies, we will only talk about one, and there's also different ways to, to achieve what we are doing here, and this is the way uh, we have chosen for this platform. So how do we get here? Uh, before we can understand how we can have a whole cluster, we have to look at the life cycle of a, of a single node, and we will look at how the node boots, and how we can actually confirm what software is running inside of it. So just a, a quick recap about measured boot. Uh, in case you have never heard of this term, the idea is that you get an understanding about the software and the firmware that is running on a computer. And you do this by basically taking a measurement at every step of the boot process. And as long as this measurement is immutable afterwards, the later stages cannot lie about what happened before. So if you have trust in the first boot stage and the first boot stage takes a measurement of the second boot stage and you do this for every step, then you, at the end you can trust all of the software that is running in the system. And usually you do this with a trust platform module or TPM. And this is just um, a, an extra piece of uh, an extra module that you have on your computer. It's not part of the CPU normally. And this, this trusted platform module, it has a lot of different functions, but the most important one is that it has a set of registers. Uh, these are called platform configuration registers. But you can only interact with them in a certain way. You cannot just write into them, but you can read them, and you can also extend them. And you do this using this function, basically. So when you start your computer with a TPM, every register will be nulled. So there will be only nulls in all the registers. 
And when you extend data into the TPM, you choose one of the registers. And the TPM will create a hash over the existing value that is stored in the register and appends your data to it and then hashes this. And this is the new PCR value. And what this means is you cannot lie about what has been measured before because this hash will also be included in the next hash value. And only using this method, you can create a measured boot chain. Um, th this is the measured boot chain you would have on a normal computer. Um, you have the firmware, which uh, it depends, but uh, let's just assume it is immutable. It is stored in, a, in ROM. And this is what, what first starts, what has the uh, execution. And it will load the next stage, in this case, the bootloader. It will create a hash over the bootloader. It will extend this into a PCR. And only then will it start executing the bootloader. And then the bootloader does the same thing. It will load the next component into memory. It will create a hash. And it will measure this into the TPM. The next concept I want to talk about is uh, protection rings. I'm sure most of you have heard about the concept before. The idea is, is just to have different uh, layers of privileges in, inside of your CPU, and most architectures have this. And the idea is that higher level or protection rings with a lower number have higher privileges. And this means they have control over the memory of the lower layers. But the opposite is not true. So you can have memory areas that are protected from the rings uh, that have the higher number. So for example, in this case, the user space cannot read kernel memory. And the hypervisor can have memory that is protected from uh, the kernel, for example. And these will now become important. So coming back to AMD and how we boot our node, uh, Paul already explained that when you create a new virtual machine, the hypervisor starts by loading the initial memory contents into pages, and then starting a guest context. And in this state, the, the guest memory is still unencrypted. And then the guest memory will be measured, and then it will be encrypted. And at this point, the hypervisor has no control over what is inside of the memory anymore. Then there is two things that happen. Uh, first, the, the initial memory, the, the launch measurement will be checked against an ID block that is optional. And this just allows the owner of the virtual machine in advance to have a, a signed blob that it can hand to the hypervisor. And then only virtual machines that have the launch digest that is specified in the ID block can be booted. But more interestingly, this launch measurement will also be included in any attestation report. And this is also what Paul showed you before. So later on, I can actually know that this virtual machine had exactly this memory content when it was created. Next, we will talk about the rings that exist inside of the virtual machine. Um, AMD defines multiple virtual machine privilege levels, or VMPLs. And there are more than two, but th these are the, the important ones here. So in this initial memory, there is a piece of software called the SVSM, which is the Secure Service Module. And this is a specification by AMD. There are multiple implementations for this. But the interesting part is it runs in its own ring. So it can have memory and code that is protected from the other privileged layers. And what this allows us to do is to actually emulate a TPM in this lower privilege layer. And this means that we can actually use this for measured boot. And we don't have to be, we can know that the higher privilege layers cannot change the contents of the TPM. So we can trust it. So using this SVSM, we can then load more code into the guest memory. 
So we can load firmware. In our case, this is just UEFI firmware called OVMF. Um, this then implements the UEFI spec. Um, this stage will then load and measure a unified kernel image. I will explain what this is as well. And then this uh, will have some form of measurement about the root file system of the Linux that we are booting. So next, let's look at a unified kernel image. Um, I, I said before that we are loading UEFI firmware. And unified kernel image basically uses the same format as your bootloader, for example, grub. But instead of being dynamic and having multiple ways of booting different operating systems, this unified kernel image can only do one thing. It can only load the kernel and init RD and the kernel command line that is included inside of this image. And this is very neat for, for measured boot because you don't have to think about the individual components that make up your kernel. You have all of this in one package. It will be measured as one. And then this has your kernel, your init RD, and your kernel command line. And what is also shown here, the kernel command line has a root hash. And this root hash is important for the next stage, which is the, the root file system of the node. And as you see here, because it's already included in this unified kernel image, the root hash is already measured at this stage. So the next stage uses DM Verity. DM Verity allows you to have a read-only file system, an immutable file system. And it allows you to do this without measuring the whole file system before use. So it's lazy and it's very efficient for read-only access. And it does so by storing the, the contents of the file system and a tree of hashes next to it. And whenever you want to read a block of the file system, um, you will use this tree. And this tree basically consists of individual hashes of blocks of the file system on the lowest layer. And then on the higher layers, you combine multiple of these hashes together. And this is how you form the hash tree. And this makes it very efficient to check the hash tree live all the way up to the root hash. So when you want to read a block, you will first hash it, then hash it up all the way to the root. But you can reuse the, the other hashes that are stored already in the hash tree on the partition. And then you can check if you are still getting to the same root hash. So this is very important, because otherwise you would have to hash the whole file system, which could be huge. So this is how we use this uh, in, a, in a constellation node. We have the same components as before. We have the root file system on the right side that is strictly read-only. This is enforced by DM Verity. We have Fedora running inside of that as the user land. We have some of our own software in there. There's the bootstrapper that will be important for Kubernetes. And then we also have a second disk where we store the state of Kubernetes. Uh, and on the first boot, this is completely zeroed and it's using authenticated encryption. So the data is encrypted and we can detect changes. And this is where we store container images and the state uh, of your containers and so on. So now we kind of got here. We have individual confidential virtual machines, but there's still no connection between them, and there's still no way for us to actually know what we booted. So the question is now, how do we get to a confidential context? So all of the nodes are in the same context, and we have a way to meaningfully attest the whole cluster. And this is how we do it. Uh, the basic idea is when you first provision your infrastructure, you don't have a Kubernetes cluster yet. You only have individual nodes that perform this, this boot process I showed you before. And basically, all of the nodes are waiting to be initialized, or at least one node needs to be initialized by us. So we as the administrator or 
DevOps engineer, um, create a connection to the first node that we want to initialize. And we use an attested TLS handshake. Um, and what this does is it performs remote attestation and it will then create a TLS connection but only if the attestation works. So this is similar to what you would do in a browser, but you actually know if the connection is established that you actually performed the remote attestation and you will also know what software is running inside of the node. You will know that this is running inside of a confidential virtual machine with the specification that you provide in your config. And you will also know exactly what software is running, and you know that you are the first and only person to initialize this node. So after this ATL, ATLS handshake succeeds, you have a secure connection, and over this connection you send some configuration data to the first node. It will bootstrap Kubernetes inside of there, and it will give you back the configuration file that you need to access the cluster. So let's zoom in a little bit to the attested TLS handshake. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail on how TLS works, but ATLS is just a little extension to how this works. And the interesting part is, in the first message, we send over a nonce, and then in the response from, from the confidential virtual machine, we get back an attestation statement, and this can be verified by us on the client side, and only if this verification is successful, we will continue with the, with the handshake. And how do we actually verify this? This is similar to what Paul showed you before, but we have now two components. We have the actual attestation report. This is signed by the V-check that Paul showed you. But more importantly, the report data of this attestation report contains a public key. And this is generated inside of this uh, VMPL0 in the SVSM that has the virtual TPM. And this is how we uh, get a connection between the SEV attestation report and the virtual TPM. And we use this public key to then check the signature of a VTPM quote. And a, VT, uh, a TPM quote is just a mechanism that the TPM uses to show the state of the TPM and it's signed so you can trust it. So you can check that it's actually from the correct TPM. So after checking the SEV attestation report, we get this key, the attestation key. We can check that the VTPM quote is correctly signed and then we actually get the contents of the PCRs at the time that we asked for the attestation report. And most importantly, we also get the nonce that we sent over during the ATLS handshake. So now, using the PCRs, we can actually know that the measured boot did exactly what we, uh, what we wanted it to do. And we also got back our nonce, so we can, we can check uh, that this was actually performed live as we asked for the data, and it's not an old quote. And what will also happen is, after the first ATLS handshake, we will actually extend a value into one of the PCRs, and this just prevents uh, the node from being initialized twice, because after that, if you ask for a new quote, it will always have this um, PCR extended. So this is how we get the, the first node, and this is how we get a Kubernetes cluster. And now let's talk about actually scaling this up into a full Kubernetes cluster. And what you see here is uh, the new node is on the left side, and on the right side you have the existing cluster. And inside of this cluster we have a microservice that is doing the whole uh, ATLS handshake for us. And this time we do an ATLS handshake in both directions. So the newly joining node will prove that it is running the same software as the rest of the cluster, that it's also running in a CVM, will prove that it's fresh, that it was not, not initialized before. 
and also the existing cluster will prove towards the new node that it's also running in a CVM and that it is running all of the correct software. And only if, if this handshake succeeds um, will you actually be allowed to join the cluster by being handed uh, a join token. So this is just how this looks on a, on the layer deeper. Um, you have a nonce going one way, you have the attestation go statement going back, then you have a second nonce, and then you have also have a second attestation statement going back. And as you can see, you have a attestation verification happening on both sides. So this is how we get to this state. We perform remote attestation on the first node, and we know that the first node will perform the same remote attestation with the rest of the cluster. And this is how we know that every node is actually running the software in the state that we configured. And also, because we got a TLS certificate and secret key during the initialization, we can now connect to the Kubernetes cluster in a secure way and know that it's actually the cluster that we initialized. So just, just a quick reminder, Constellation is open source. It's on GitHub. It's very easy to use. Um, you, can, you can try it out by just creating a configuration file, by then creating the infrastructure, and the init will then perform the remote attestation that I showed you. And after that, you have a normal Kubernetes um, configuration file that you can use with all of your existing tooling. So please check it out on GitHub. Uh, we, we run on all of the major clouds, so AWS, uh, Azure, GCP, OpenStack. Uh, we have support for AMD SCV. Uh, we also will soon have support for Intel TDX. And you can also try it out on your laptop locally. This is called a mini constellation. It will, it will not use confidential computing, but it's a great way to just see how it feels and see that the UX is just the way you would expect it to be. So with that, uh, I think we are ready for questions. So the question is, can it be used for, for very small clusters like K3S? Okay, um, I would say it can be. Um, one, you, can, you can basically create a cluster that is only one node if you want to. Um, one thing is that we, we require you to, to use a supported cloud provider. So we do not support bare metal provisioning at this point. Um, this is just what allows us to do things like auto-scaling. We also allow you to use all of the same Kubernetes features like load balancers, get storage from the cloud provider that is automatically encrypted by us. So we use a lot of the cloud provider features, but we make it safe for you to use. Yeah. But creating a small cluster is, is perfectly possible. And using OpenStack, you could even uh, host it on your own infrastructure. So I think the I think the question is if this not just moves the the attack layer to to another kind of side channel. I mean, the answer is of course you. <laughs> there are still side channels that aren't covered by this technology, but you have a huge decreasement in trusted computing base. So there are so many attacks that you uh, prevent with this. 
and I think it's it's a step in the right direction. So yeah, like I said, with without this, you are just like leaving your your secrets like lagging around somewhere here, you know. And with this, okay, you put your secrets in the safe, and of course, someone could still like come with special equipment and break it up and steal your secrets, but the protection level is much higher. And many of the side channel attacks that you could like m mount against the secret processor require something like a lab environment, or you have to like uh, open the, the processor and I don't know, use some special laser to, 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 to do some attacks or so. So yeah, I think it's, it's a huge improvement for the public cloud. So. I think you do because you don't have to trust the hypervisor, which is a huge. Oh, the the question is, <laughs> if we actually get a reduction in the in the TCB by doing this, or if it's just a defense and death mechanism. Uh, I think quite clearly we we do reduce the the trusted uh, computing base because before you have the whole host operating system that is part of the trusted TCB, you have attacks where someone just freezes and steals your RAM module. <laughs> you have things like that. And now, of course, the CPU could have a, a vulnerability in the microcode or something like that. But this is also something that you have to care about before confidential computing. So I think it is a clear reduction. So to repeat the question, uh, what kind of business model do we see for this and what would people use this for? Um, basically, we hear from a lot of people that they would like to move workloads into the cloud, but either they, they don't trust it or they're not allowed to. And with this, you actually are able to move into the cloud or move away from your own data center but you don't lose all of the control because you know before you send any data into this Kubernetes cluster that you can actually trust it and that you are the only one who has control over this. And the, the kinds of customers we envision are people who work in regulated industries, um, people who don't trust the cloud currently but who see the benefits that it could bring to them basically. To extend on this, um, yeah, like you could imagine, especially something like health data or finance, uh, to be good use cases for use cases for it. And there are also use cases um, you could build with confidential computing that aren't possible right now. So, for imagine, um, right now what we presented is like you're using remote attestation as the the workload provider and you're, you want to verify that your code is running as expected. But you could also, in addition, hand um, attestation statements to your customers, so like the data owner. S and you could prove to a data owner that you as a workload provider actually are running the software that we are saying you are. So you could, um, a data owner could verify that you are running an an application as expected before handing uh, confidential data to you. So, so one, one example I can give is Signal is using another confidential computing technology that is Intel SGX, and they implemented a contact sync. So basically what, what they implemented is a service where you upload your contact book, 
but your Signal app will perform remote attestation and will only upload your contact book if it knows the software that is running remotely. And this allows them to prove we do check what other users in your contact book are using Signal, but we do not have access to your contacts, basically. So they can prove what kind of functions they can perform on your data. And this is something that's not possible before, at least not on arbitrary computations. So the question is, if we have certification for this, um, I think the, the answer is, is twofold. The one question is if, if Constellation has the kind of certification, and the other question is um, if the, the users um, actually are allowed or are, are have to use something like Constellation. Uh, so, so I think the, the second question is actually a bit more interesting. There, there's some things happening. Um, for example, with the, the BSE Grundschutz, that, that we may get to a point where government may be allowed to move data into the cloud if they are using something with con confidential computing where they can prove that the cloud provider doesn't have access. This is not the case yet, but it's something that we hope could shift. I mean, the, I think the same thing applies, that, that we would like some of the regulation to move in this direction. Um, financial industries, for example, they, have, they are often allowed to, to already move into the cloud. And for them, it's often a question of if they themselves trust the cloud provider. So in this case, it would actually be a bit simpler to apply this. We will be around uh, the conference, um, at least for today. And if you like to have a demo of Constellation, just uh, ask us. Um, here, we have laptops with us to um, show you and give you some more insights if we want to. Also, um, this whole thing is open source. Check it out on GitHub, leave us a star. Um, you can also contribute, you can just test it out. It's, it's really easy. Yeah, thank you.